Hello and welcome to a redo of yesterday's Remy's Rave of the Day. We had some audio problems once again. My apologies for that. And so, like I said, we're going to do a redo of what I was saying yesterday on Remy's Rave of the Day. A Tuesday edition, we were raving about the word compassion. Compassion was the word that, we're, that we were raving about yesterday. And if you were to do a New Testament search of that word, you do a count by book, you would find that compassion is found in the Gospel of Matthew five times. The Gospel of Matthew comes in first place, recording the word compassion five times. Luke comes in second place with four times. And then you're going to have all these different other occurrences, like the book of Philemon coming in at three times. Now, keep in mind, when I did this search, the search for compassion, it's not just looking Looking at our English translations for the word compassion, it could be also the word heart. It could be the word affections. And even though it's not directly the word compassion, it is still that word when you see the word heart or when you see the word affections because it is a root word search. So you get a little bit deeper and you ask the question, where does the word compassion occur the most in a book that has a few chapters in it? And the answer is the book of Philemon. Coming in at 62.6% .6 of the time, Philemon is mentioning the word compassion. You get a little bit deeper, you do a count by chapter, and Philemon is still going to win when it comes to a count by chapter, seeming because Philemon only has one chapter, if you will. And so we focus our attention to the book of Philemon and we'll turn to other different gospels like Matthew to see of this word compassion, how it's used, things of that nature. So you open up your Bibles and you look at the book of Philemon. Go to Philemon. And when you get to the book of Philemon... You are going to look at verse number 7. Philemon is just before the book of Hebrews. So when you get to the book of Philemon, notice verse number 7. Verse number 7 of Philemon, he says, For I have come to have much joy and comfort in love. This is Paul writing to this man, saying, Because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. You see that word hearts there? That's the word compassion. So we read it again, and he says, For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, Philemon, the selfless love, sacrificial love, you're putting everybody else's needs before your needs, you're wanting what is best for everybody else because the compassion of the saints have been refreshed through you. In other words, Paul says, you know, the church that meets in your house, finally, man, you, I can have so much joy and I, and I have so much comfort and the love and how you treat the saints that meet in your house that they themselves, the church, the saints that meet there, they themselves have compassion. They are compassionate individuals because you, Philemon, are compassionate. And you say in the book of Philemon, Paul is saying, because of that, I'm going to send you somebody, somebody that you know, somebody who has wronged you, and you need to show compassion to this man as well. And his name is Onesimus. Go down to verse 12. Verse 12, Philemon, or Philemon says, Paul writing to Philemon says, I have sent him back to you in person that is sending my very heart, my compassion. Maybe Paul's trying to get at how through some conversion, through some dialogue between Paul and Onesimus, Paul begins to find out some more characteristics of Onesimus saying, this man, Onesimus, as I got to know him, got to convert him, he is actually a compassionate individual. At least he is now. And so when Paul says, look, I'm sending him back to you, and he's going to go on to say, saying, he's really useful for me. I can use him where I am, but I know the relationship that is a, between a master and a slave. Paul respects that relationship. And so he's going to send Onesimus back, and he says, Okay, finally, man, I'm sending my very heart back to you, Onesimus, my compassion to you. As you have shown compassion toward the saints who meet in your house, 
you need to show the same kind of passion to this man. Because if you do, Paul says, you go down to verse 20 of Philemon. If you do that, Paul says, he says, yes, brother, let me benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Refresh my compassion in Christ. Paul says, Philemon, if you accept Onesimus, you show compassion the way you've been showing all the things that meet in your church. If you do that and when I hear of that, that's going to encourage me to be more compassionate. Just because of the type of relationship that this is, master and slave relationship. Because Philemon could have wronged him. He could have beat him up. I mean, just all kinds of consequences. And Paul says, I know you can do that. But I want you to choose a different route. I want you to choose compassion. And you notice how in verse 20 he says, you're going to refresh my heart in Christ. And it's as if Paul says to Philemon, as he's trying to tell them, tell him, show compassion towards Onesimus as you've been showing to the other saints that meet in your house. It's as if Paul says, remember the compassion of the Lord. Which makes us ask the question, right? How... Did Jesus behave in his compassion? What kind of compassion did he show when he was on the earth? And that causes us to go back to the Gospel of Matthew. Because remember, when you do a count by book of this word compassion, the Gospel of Matthew comes in at five times, comes in at first place. And so let's just look at the, some of the occurrences of this word compassion. When we explore that question, how did Jesus act? How did he demonstrate compassion? And here's one of the passages. You can go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And you can go to verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. And notice what this says. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 the Bible says, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. You're going to see the same point if you further along in the Gospel of Matthew. You go to Matthew chapter 14, if I remember correctly. Yes, chapter 14. And let's start in verse 13, even though it's really in verse 14. You go to Matthew 14, go to verse 13. It says, now, when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them, and he healed their sick. Same exact thought in chapter 9, verse 36. You're going to see the exact same thing. You go a little bit further in the Gospel of Matthew. You go to chapter 15, Matthew 15, and look at verse 32. 15, verse 32. It says, And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry for they might faint on the way. And that's when the loaves and the fish come into play. Jesus quantifies that, gets bigger amounts to feed this 4,000 as well as the 5,000. But you just notice this thread. You notice this trend where Jesus fills compassion and then he acts upon it. Couldn't we say that's a definition of the word compassion? That it's not just about having this feeling, but it's about doing something. It's about action. Because I don't know if you could really say someone has compassion if they just had the feeling and then there's no action behind that. You know, it's kind of like the illustration in James chapter 2 when James is really talking about the idea of a dead faith individual. But he brings up an illustration saying, you know, for those who are poor, if you just say to those individuals, go warm and be filled and you don't give them anything. You know, that's not really showing any compassion. That's not really doing much. So how can you say you really have compassion? So if you really want a good definition of this word compassion, according to how Jesus demonstrated that quality, it would be having that feeling plus acting upon that feeling. You have a feeling and then you have an action behind that. And Jesus tells a similar story of that definition in the Gospel of Matthew. If you flip in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, Matthew 18, starting in verse 21. This is the incident where Peter is asking Jesus, you know, how many times am I supposed to forgive 
somebody? Is it just seven times or 70 times seven? It's that story. And so you start in Matthew 18, verse 21. It says, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Verse 25, but since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children. Man, can you imagine that? Being sold along with your wife and your children. Then it goes on to say, verse 25, and all that he had, his possessions, and, verse 25, repayment to be made. So it's not just you and your family, your possessions, you go along with you, but oh, by the way, you still owe me. Verse 26, so the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. Verse 27, the Lord of that slave, look at that, felt compassion, and here's the action. He felt it, here's the action, verse 27, and released him and forgave him the debt that he owed. Wow. Wow. Everything was going to be sold, him, his children, his family, his possessions. You still owe me my debt. It's a lot of debt. This is what this slave did. Have patience on me. The Lord instantly forgave him because he had that feeling that he acted upon that. I, I feel like we need to read further into the story because there's so much more. Verse 28. But that slave, you know, that same slave who was released, that same slave who was forgiven... Verse 28, that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves, so maybe, you know, just a friend or something, who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him. Man, talk about graphic, right? Saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay him. Doesn't that sound familiar? Verse 26, that's what that slave did. And now his fellow slave is saying the exact same thing. So this slave who was hearing this back, he's familiar with what's being said. Verse 30, but he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. No feeling of compassion. Nothing. Verse 31, so when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and his fellow slave pleaded with him. Remember verse 33, should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you and his Lord and his Lord moved with anger handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed to him. That's kind of interesting. Sometimes Jesus, when he would come upon a crowd and he felt sorry for them, because again, remember Matthew 9 verse 36, they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sometimes the text would say he was moved with compassion. The Lord here, verse 34, was moved, not with compassion, but moved with anger. Because of course, he figured out his slave, you didn't do the same thing that I did to you. You didn't forgive like I forgave you. You didn't have mercy on your fellow slave like I, I had mercy on you. I felt compassion for you and released you, forgave you. There's that action. So how is how does this connect with Philemon, the book that which we start out with? Well, here's how it connects. Paul says, Philemon, man, I'm so glad I hear that you're doing so well. You have a great relationship with the church there that meets in your home. You have a great relationship with God. I understand somebody, one of your slaves, has wronged you, Onesimus. So Paul says, man, the saints that meet in your home, they are full of compassion. All because of you, Philemon, because you're compassionate towards them. So they, in return, are compassionate towards you and towards one another. But then this slave over here, Onesimus, who may have wronged you, like that master in Matthew 18, you need to act like that master and forgive Onesimus and his debt. In fact, Paul's going to go on and say, if there's any wrong, charge it to my account. That's what Paul's going to say in Philemon. He says, forgive him, release him. That is the idea of compassion, feeling it, 
and then acting upon it. This is a redo of Remy's Rave of the Day from yesterday. We had some audio problems, so just wanted to do this once again. Please consider liking and sharing this video, as well as liking and sharing this page. We are raving about the work of passion. Sorry for the audio issues yesterday. Lord willing, we'll do better. Again, we're going to do this tomorrow, Lord willing, around 3 p.m. with another word or phrase, and we're going to rave about it. Again, please consider liking and sharing this video, as well as liking and sharing this page. We are at 9195 Dishman Road, 919. 95 Dishman Road, Meadows Church of Christ, right here in Beaumont, in the great state of Texas. I've been your host, Remy, or better known as Remington Afri, the youth minister at the Meadows Church of Christ, right here in Beaumont, in the great state of Texas. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. Continue to have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing. Godspeed.